Good morning, friends. I greet you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. I have an announcement this morning. Uh, the UT Martin Wesley Foundation is going to be having an outside fall party this year, and they need your help. Uh, they're looking for people to make baked goods as prizes for the cakewalk, as well as baked goods just to give out to the students. Uh, so if, if you would like to make some baked goods for the UT Martin Wesley Foundation, uh, go ahead and make them. And this Saturday, Miss Beth is going to pick them up from the kitchen at noon, and she will take them up there to, to the Wesley Foundation at Martin. Is everybody pretty clear on that? All right. Uh, and to keep up with our abbreviated worship time we will jump right into prayer time does anybody have any joys or concerns this morning what is your joy mrs jordan a what Is that this week? <laughs> Was it yesterday? Is that this week? One day this week? Yeah, October the 28th of 2008. She said yes. And she's been saying, oh, no, ever since. <laughs> but I don't know where I'd be without you, Madra. Are there any other joys or concerns? Well, I'll stand in a moment of silence, and then I'll offer a pastoral prayer, and then we'll all join in the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Holy God, thank you for the gift of another day. Thank you for sending Jesus, your son, when your time had come to deliver us from slavery to sin and death. And thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to empower your church here on earth. Help us to continue in their power and outreach in our dark times. Send another breath of your spirit to give us the motivation and the courage to step out in faith knowing that where we go, you are already there working. Remind us that we cannot go anywhere to escape your protection nor your grace. You have heard and you know all of our joys and our concerns, and we ask that your perfect will be done in and for each person on our prayer list and the people that are on our minds this morning Open our hearts and minds today to your word and your will. So when we leave this place, we will know and understand that we have not come to church today, but that we are the church. Let us walk closer to you, even in our darkest hours, and let us feel your presence and peace as we go through our days. Work on us and through us to show your love and mercy in this world so more people outside these walls might know that you alone are God. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. Would you stand with me for the reading of the gospel? <clears throat> But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them was a lawyer, asked Jesus a question testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me and for me this morning. Heavenly Father, open my mouth and give me your words of love and grace to speak to your people today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> uh, friends, the first thing to get out on the table for us today is this is, again, not a parable. We had a series of five parables in a row. Uh, last week, we broke our series. This week, again, I want to remind everybody that this is not a parable. Now, with that said, let's get the five questions out of the way. The who is Jesus, the disciples, and the Pharisees. The what is more questioning of Jesus. The where, they are still in the temple. And if I'm not mistaken, from here to the Garden of Gethsemane, all, the majority of the action will happen somewhere in or near the temple when it's the last week of Jesus' life on earth uh, prior to the resurrection. Uh, I, I've said this and, and will continue to say it. At least one-third of each of the synoptic gospels is devoted solely to the last week of Jesus' life. Uh, the first two, and a, two years and how, however long it really is, this last week we get more detail than in any other section of the Gospels. Uh, they did that for a reason, to show us that Jesus was really putting up with a lot from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The why. The why is in the first verse of today's text. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves around him. They gathered themselves together. In other words, they surrounded Jesus. And one of them was a, a snarky, smart mouth lawyer, and present company excluded. Uh, and and this, this lawyer thought that he knew the law better than Jesus would know. And he went up and he questioned him and he said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So, there are 613 laws in the complete law of God. We Christians tend to narrow that down to 10 just to keep it easy. But in addition to the 10 that we have, there are 603 more. And surely Jesus won't get this question right. Because Jesus didn't have a rabbi. Jesus was raised way out. And forgive me if any of y'all are from this place. 
But Jesus is from way out in Bucksnort, Tennessee. Do y'all know where that is? Is anybody actually from there? Thanks be to God. So Jesus is from way out in this little town. It's barely a wide spot in the road. The only stop sign in town says, Whoa! Jesus won't get this question right for sure because He can't know the law. There's no way. But Jesus says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. Whenever I read this, I'm always reminded of Susanna Wesley's answer to John Wesley. Uh, when he was 17, he went off to college, and he would write her letters back, back, back at home. And in one of his letters, he asked her, what is a good working definition of sin? And, and she sent him back a letter and she said, if anything takes your passion and your love away from God, that thing to you, no matter how good it is, is sin to you. That's a pretty good working definition of sin, right? And that always goes back to this commandment right here that if I am loving God with my whole heart my whole soul and my whole mind then nothing can come between me and God and yet we all live in the 21st century and we have internet we have cars we have jobs we have kids now remember the working definition. No matter how good that thing is, Harley Davidson's, if it gets between you and your love for God, then that thing to you is a sin. If it takes away your heart, if it takes away your soul, and it takes your mind off of God, even for a minute, then that thing to you is sin. J. Ellsworth Callis used to teach at Asbury Seminary, and J. Ellsworth Callis told all of us, this holy desk is not your personal confessional. In other words, don't stand behind the pulpit and confess your sins to your congregation. So don't take what I'm fixing to say as a personal confessional. Just take this as informational. I am no good at this commandment. Last week I mentioned something about a rodeo and a guy riding a bull that weighed more than my 1987 Toyota pickup truck. Let me say this. I have a better chance at riding that bull that I mentioned last week for eight seconds than I do following this commandment for eight seconds. Okay? I have the attention span of a gnat, and therefore this commandment is just a little bit out of my reach. So I said all that to say this. I am in need of a redeemer to redeem my mind, my heart, and my soul back to this commandment so at least I have a shot at keeping my mind on God, at loving God with my whole heart. Now, Jesus did not go back and reinvent the wheel to tell to tell those of us that basically stick to the New Testament that there's a new way of loving God, that there's a new way of serving God, or that there is a new way of, of following God. This text right here, if any of you have a reference Bible, you will see that this is referenced all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. 
And I want to show you Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. If you notice, there's one word different from Deuteronomy than what Jesus said. And I'll tell you this, Moses had to misquote God in that text because there's no way Jesus misquoted God. Notice the last word is might, and Jesus said mind. But I would even argue if you're loving God with your heart, your soul, and your mind, your might's going to come with it. Does that make sense? So Jesus continued with his answer, and he said, The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. This one is easy to follow as long as Linda Tilly is your next door neighbor. Y'all know she's the lady that used to live next door to the parsonage, right? She has since moved out. She did not pull in the driveway at 3 in the morning listening to ACDC. She was very quiet. She kept the yard up. And you put a biker next to her. <laughs> But I don't roll in the driveway listening to ACDC either. But other th until Miss Linda, I struggled being the neighbor that was worthy of love. I'm not sure I'm worthy of love today, and that's why I'm thankful to Madra. But even if I did pull in the driveway, I don't think Miss Linda Tilly would have come out yelling and screaming at me. Do you? Now, I might have gotten a phone call later on the next day, but I don't think she would have come out yelling at me. This one is also an echo from the Old Testament. I, and I want you to hear this one in its entirety. This comes from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, and it says this. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is right out of God's mouth that we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Am I the only one in the room today that's not any good at this? Don't answer that. Now, I want us to back up just a little bit and look at Leviticus 19, 17, and then 18. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but you shall not incur sin because of him. So in other words, don't pull a brad and run out there, hey, you idiot, turn the radio down. We shouldn't be calling our brothers and sisters idiots. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. In other words, if they are doing something that you think you might find yourself doing later on, let it go. Or if they're doing something that you've already done in the past, let it go. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And, and let me say again, I am not very good at this commandment. On these two, Jesus goes on and he says, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Since we're talking about the law today, I have to go back and refer to a tennis match. There are a lot of rules in tennis. Did you know that? Does anybody play tennis? Am I good? I'm the only one that plays tennis in the room. Well, played. Anyway, tennis has got a lot of rules. It's got an odd way of scoring. You've got to have a net. There are two lines on the outside of the tennis court. Did you know that? When you're playing singles, you play to the inside line. When you're playing doubles, you play to the outside line. Those big squares that are up by the net, if you're serving, you stand to the right, 
and serve diagonally to the other square. Do you know why? Because that, that Federer guy can serve at 115 miles an hour. And if I'm standing over here, and he serves that ball over there, what are the chances I can get to it if it's going 105 miles an hour? So I have some general idea of where that ball is going to land when he serves at 105 miles an hour. So I can be over here, and I can be halfway ready. Right? Now, what do the rules of tennis and the 613 commandments of God have to do with anything? We're all supposed to be playing the same game. And if I'm over here with my racket and Federer serves the ball and I hit the ball over here, how mad do you think he's going to be at me? He's not going to be too mad because he just got a point and it's still his serve. So we change sides and he hits the ball at 105 again and I hit the ball out of bounds again. He's going to get sick and tired of that, right? God gave us 613 commandments to let us all know that we're on level ground. We're all supposed to be playing the same game. We're all supposed to be playing to the same boundaries. We're all supposed to be serving in the little square that's just the other side of the net. But these guys snarkily come up to Jesus and want to know which one's the most important. These two are the most important. It's like a net in tennis. Without a net... There's no sense in playing. Without a right side boundary, you can get away without that. Without a left side boundary, you can get away with that. But without the net, there's no sense in playing. So Jesus, on, the, on these two commandments are the whole law. Now, if the Pharisees had just a little bit of love, they might not have been being so mean to Jesus. If the Pharisees had had just a little bit of love, they might not have been so willing to walk through town and say, hey, you're violating this law. You broke that law. You broke this law. Nobody appointed. God, did, God never appointed them to be the referees at the tennis match. They just took it upon themselves. While he's got the Pharisees' attention, Jesus goes into a little rant about himself in the third person. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? So Jesus, is, Jesus has got his racket ready. The Pharisees have served. And Jesus just returned. And now Jesus is asking them a question to get a gauge on their understanding. I don't think they understood Jesus nearly as much as they think they did, nor do I believe they understood God as much because their answer is, He's the Son of David. Jesus goes on and says, how is it then that David in the Spirit, that in the Spirit is a very, that should call our attention to the comment that's coming next? Because David was inspired when he wrote the Psalms. Uh, again, if you have a reference Bible, this will reference you back to Psalm 110, verse 1. We're going to read through the whole Psalm in just a minute. But that, that comment in the Spirit is very important because David was under inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he wrote Psalm 110. And David said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand 
until I put your enemies beneath your feet. Now, the problem that 21st century Americans have is we don't understand that when Jesus quoted the first verse of a psalm to the Pharisees, the Pharisees would have thought the whole psalm. They wouldn't have stopped. I know we live in a 10-second soundbite world, and we think that in this first verse of Psalm 110, we've gotten the whole thing, but we haven't. So what the Pharisees would have heard is this. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over the broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. That's what the Pharisees would have heard. Because in the Spirit... God was giving David the words to write about the Messiah, who in in the Greek is called the Christ. That whole psalm is about Jesus, not just the first verse. They now understand that Jesus is talking about himself. And this question that Jesus asked, if David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? See, if we were going to write this in modern day English, and if we were going to write it with a Christian understanding, we would have written this, if David calls me Lord, how am I his son? Off the top of your head, and I didn't intend to talk about this or I would have made notes. Off the top of your head, think about the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is our understanding of the Messiah, what we tend to call Christ, the person of Jesus. But the Pharisees did not understand that Jesus had to be in the family of David and the family of the priests. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. Y'all know what season's coming up right after Thanksgiving? Christmas. Christmas. So at this point for the Pharisees, the pride is getting the better of them. And if, if we go back to that first verse, the Pharisees heard that Jesus had stifled or quietened the Sadducees. In other words, the Pharisees heard the Sadducees got their pride handed back to them. And now Jesus is handing the Pharisees their pride as well. Because as we see Matthew writes that no one...